You are listening to The Pull List Podcast with Chris Poirier and Hector Mirai, part of the Love Thy Nerd Podcast Network. Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of The Pull List Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Chris Poirier, and I am here with my partner in crime, the one and only Hector. Hector, how about you say hello real quick? Hi, everybody. How are you doing? That's Hector. Hector's awesome. We have already put one episode in the can, and we decided we wanted to release that to you as a special zero episode. So hopefully you got a chance to listen to that where we claimed it was the first episode. So this is your first, second, first episode? Something like that. But we're here to talk about comics. Um, We're part of the Love Thy Nerd podcasting network. We're super happy to be here and be able to bring comics and all the awesome fandom that comes with it. So we're going to talk about all those wonderful things of comics, whether it's in the physical print, whether we read them in digital, whether we go and see the cool movies or they bring us new streaming services like DC Universe and bring us original content through those type of things and just talk about life and belief and how all those things kind of just intermingle because that's a lot about who Hector and I are kind of on the day. So for me, really quickly, as we mentioned in the first episode, but for new listeners, hi, uh, I manage a comic book store during the day and then do some work at my local church doing community outreach and such on the weekends. And Hector is kind of the reason that I'm here, but I'll let him tell you kind of his story really quick too and then we'll just go ahead and jump into what we do and want to talk about here on the pull list so i'm hector mirai and i am the primary writer for the faith and fandom book series it's a book series of essays on faith and geek culture devotionals on bible studies video games superheroes comic books etc etc and i spend probably about 28 weekends a year doing comic cons in the Southeast, um, doing some ministry there. So Chris spends his days in the comic book shops and I spend most of my weekends in the comic cons. And so, you know, we have a good basis covered. And so I'd officially like to welcome you to the most electrifying comic book podcast in sports entertainment history. I mean, right. I I think we can go ahead and say that now you can click five stars just about everywhere because it's going to be awesome. Yeah, there we go. So how we want to kind of bring content to you guys each and every, it's going to be probably every two weeks or so, but we might do it more often. We might do it less often. Life is crazy, but we're going to try to definitely get stuff to you in the bi-weekly format. And we just want to talk about, well, Hector, uh, what are you reading or watching right now that has you excited? All right. So reading, I am currently reading Red Hood. Um, I'm a Jason Todd follower um, and I've enjoyed a lot of the stuff they're doing with that. His deconstruction. As of late, um, currently also reading uh, Immortal Hulk, uh, drudging through The Walking Dead. Um, (laughs) I am reading uh, Unnatural and the crazy turns that that is taking. Also checking out Captain America, Daredevil, basically all the Batman books. And uh, kind of also been reading um, Teen Titans briefly lately, just because... Red Hood is in it, and I'm a sucker for some crossovers. Oh, there you go. Well, DC's definitely collecting your money and your uh, dollar bills on that one, because yeah. uh, they have a few different things going on right now. Um, but that that's the nature of the business, isn't it? They always are trying to pull us into books that we're not reading. And sometimes they succeed. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, there's, a, there's a Facebook page that covers all Red Hood-related things, so they, they get me whenever they start posting, you know, this or that. Also, um, just throw out DC or Heroes in Crisis is also reading that, and that's you know just oh, getting yeah. started. But and we'll lot. we'll save that for a little later because we we definitely have some stuff to talk about there that Tom King is uh, once again I think trying to blow our minds. Well, you know, doing work. I mean, he's about to wrap up Mister Miracle, which has been just amazing, and then he drops Heroes in Crisis number one and already pivoted to the next mind blowing thing in the DC universe for at least for me anyway, but we can, we can save that. Um, That's important. Um, As our friends over at free play, like to say, uh, save it for the podcast, which this is. So we'll talk about that soon. Um, So what was kind of, what was the high point for you in the last two weeks? Uh, You listed a bunch of stuff. Uh, You've got Marvel in there. You got image in there, DC, so you're pretty well rounded, which is good. I'm kind of I'm trying similar. to be because you know I'm a DC <laughs> fanboy at heart, so I've got to kind of spread yeah. it out a bit. I don't know. Oh, Captain America too. Reading that, um, mm-hmm. Unnatural 
to me was one of those books that looked like it was going to be really pretty um, and right. a little sketch on content, but it turned into like a bananas murder mystery. And I'm okay with that. And I'm enjoying where that's heading. Um, that was kind of a high point for me. Uh, Tom King's Batman stuff has been solid. Uh, one of the things that I like the most about him in his writing is I don't usually have a grasp on predicting of where he's going. Right. Um, like, because he'll spend, he'll, he'll wrap up a giant story in one issue or he'll spend one issue, like literally doing nothing. Um, this, this, like we spent two issues with Batman and jury duty. So that was a thing without even really accomplishing anything. But then like the most recent Batman issue, uh, had a, the whole issue was just a fight with KG beast yep. in a snowy cabin where they're basically just fighting each other to a standstill. And I'm like, this was not productive, um, but I enjoyed <laughs> it. Um, Another um, was with like Detective Comics finally feels like Detective Comics again. Oh, so do I need to actually pick that up? Because I put that down because I was kind of like, okay, get get they, me somewhere. They've started over and it's like a three issue uh, run so far. And the first issue feels like, oh man, I'm back in the 90s. Um, Ooh, like as far as the um, the storytelling and the atmosphere. But uh, they're, they're doing a run right now where... Uh, there are two fireflies at the beginning. And like, anytime you start out a story with firefly, you're like, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> uh, but it was an all an elaborate plot of two face to get Batman to help stop Cobra. Like Cobra, two face didn't know how to ask for help. Um, and he was scared that Cobra was taking over. So he did a bunch of, classic two-face style crimes that he'd well grown beyond just to get batman's attention again it was one of those things of like okay i don't know exactly where this is going so continue um but i can say probably the last three issues of detective have been really worth picking up but no once they got into the towards the end of that Clayface arc they were losing me but uh yeah yeah how about the, you? the expanded yeah the expanded bat family and Clayface was just where i kind of went what so, okay, yeah, let's see. What did I pull out of the poll this week? I've been reading uh, Cemetery Beach, which is Warren Ellis um, at Image yet again. So uh, hopefully this is an arc he'll finish because I'm still waiting on trees to finish, like really, really bad. Um, but that that's Warren, so I'm down with it. And that's kind of a crazy story. Um, it may be time travel. It may be space travel. We still don't really know. But a dude who's a recon soldier gets dropped in this planet that looks earth-like but you find out very quickly that it's not and we still don't really know what that's about he's our protagonist is still running for his life so it, it's interesting it's been fun they've got me um i've been reading gideon falls uh jeff lemire kind of a horror right. story so got got a little halloween going and that's pretty interesting so far he's he's at um, a show with you right coming up soon yeah so um the nc comic-con bull city uh plug Boom, not a sponsor, um, but could be. We should work on that. I'm learning all my polls and all my wonderful stuff from the good folks over at Free Play. So Bubba and Matt and and Kate. So all about trying to score those good uh, connections and potential sponsors. But I kind of work for them, so that's probably weird. But yeah, Jeff's going to be at that show, so we're super excited. I'm super excited just to meet him and get to talk to him about the crazy stories that he writes. Yeah, that's. Um, I, I don't. I'm not a big fan of his work. Like, just because I haven't invested in it. But honestly, yeah. he's someone I would want to meet and talk to because all of his stuff is, like, crazy original. Yes. And um, it's nice to hear original voices in comics. And the fact that he also does art on top of that. So half of the time he's writing it, half of the time he's actually just doing the art. Because um, it his art style is literally watercolor. So when you see pages of his, they're usually, like, you know, water stained and wrinkled because he's just been throwing art at it. It's, it's pretty wild. Um, so I want to talk to him about both those things, which is awesome. Um, obviously I'm a Batman guy too. So Hector and I kind of share that, that DC has just been firing on all cylinders since rebirth started about two years ago. And I, I, it's hard for me to not just be like, they're, they're just nailing it right now. Marvel's doing a lot of great <laughs> stuff too. Um, but 
yeah, half of my poll is definitely DC and then image just because of the storytelling. Um, I definitely crammed in a Nightwing story this week because I'm trying to catch up on since what happened in Batman a while ago to him. Uh, so, so spoilers. Pick up 50? Uh, so you told me to read 50 and it must be good because literally I'm failing because it is sold out. I can't get my hands on it right now. Um, okay. So that's a good problem to have in my business. Um, but kind of stinks when I'm trying to catch up. But okay. I did read Night, You Can Call Me Rick Now, Wing 51. Um, yeah, you, 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 <laughs> you missed a lot of the story there. Yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, um, Nightwing's Rick now, just so you know. Spoilers, you're welcome. Um, well, you know, that's that's their exit to kill Rick Grimes, because there can only yep. be one Rick. Oh, that makes sense. That's why they, dropped the, it's why they dropped the K, right? Yeah. It's R-I-C. Yeah. Um, but then to be fair, I flip right back around to the other side and I am reading a ton of Marvel um, Daredevil this past week was I mean, the Daredevil arc with uh, Kingpin being mayor has just been great. And we're kind of hitting that culmination point. And that's can I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Can I just say on the Daredevil thing, though, uh, I really feel you know, I'll save it for later. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> OK, yeah, no, it's fair because um, Daredevil is the other thing we want to talk about a little more. Um Life of Captain Marvel has been super good. They kind of retconned her origin a tad right now. Um, she's still Cree. It's all good. Um, but you're finding out a little more about her mother this time around. And it's giving you... This story is more about what made Captain Marvel who she is, which is kind of fun. I, it's not just Captain Marvel beating the living crap out of things. She does that. She's good at it. Um, but... This one's kind of diving into her background, which is really interesting. She's back home. She's with her family, and they're kind of working some stuff out while also progressing a story. So I think that's going to look really cool, especially knowing that a movie's coming, and these things are probably slightly interrelated because Marvel's really good at that. Um, What else? Oh, Darth Vader 22 came out this week. If you're not reading Darth Vader, um, you can pause the podcast and go read all the Darth Vader up to now. You will thank me later because Dude, it is. I've never, great. I've never been able to tell myself to read a Star Wars comic book. Like I just, I can't do it so far. That's like, that's that's fair, but seeing how Marvel Disney like decided to break the universe and everything in comics is now canon as much as it is if it's on film means you are missing stuff, and some of it is really good um, because they're filling in backstories that we know pieces of, but they're fleshing out the full story, so they're not like throwing away a lot. Um, unless you go back to like the legends and older stuff, some of you guys, sorry, you, you got voted off the Island. Um, but anything that is current coming out that brings something forward is Canon. And they're exploring a lot of background, to characters that we didn't get. So it's pre even the prequel type stuff or filling in gaps. And so far, a lot of it's been really good. Did you get a chance to read Marvel zombie this week? no, uh tell me okay. more yeah so i mean there's half a bill they're up to like marvel zombies with an s5 and, now or and that's i was i was on the first three runs of marvel sure. zombie like i did the first two runs and then i did marvel zombies versus army of darkness okay um so but after that one i kind of let it go so that's, tell me that's tell fair. me why i should care so the reason you should care is instead of trying to drag it out four to five issues to tell a story that lands kind of flat i hear you some of their content was like yep we're doing zombies because you people love some zombies yeah this one is a standalone and they're telling a brief story in the zombies universe but focused on the zombie um you get introduced to simon garth who is the zombie um who stan lee and bill everett um came up with way back in the day um like the 50s back in the day and created this standalone character the zombie who was an individual that was captured by a voodoo cult and was killed but then was resurrected during this process and given this amulet that if anyone wears the corresponding amulet that person can control the zombie um physical actions and everything so it's a quasi hero character because and this story tells us basically that he's like, oh, these are my friends, but he can't talk. So all of his monologues enter because he's a zombie. So he's like, okay. um, but 
um, this kid finds the matching amulet during the crazy zombie um, virus stuff going on in zombies and figures out that this zombie doesn't want to eat people. And there's just a interesting little story between him and this kid and the kid introducing him to the Avengers who are trying to destroy the crazy zombie horde. Um, it, I didn't expect it to be kind of touching, but this story kind of is. And it pulls this character that is, well, let's see, 50s, almost 70 years old, more, more than 70 years old. So it's really kind of cool and kind of fun. And I've been enjoying just going, wait, who is, who is Simon Garth and, and pulling that story from where he was in the past. So it's pretty cool. Okay. Well, he sold me. Go yeah. on. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So you can pick that up and you, if you want just a really cool cover, look for the variant because it's got um, Black Widow on it and it's really cool and it shouldn't cost you extra right now, but maybe because variants are weird. So if you want a cool piece of art and a cool story, you know, find that at your local comic shop. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Right? <laughs> um, so uh, your local comic shop thanks you. So that's kind of been what I've been reading. Um, it's all been really good, but I think the one thing we wanted to touch on too is we... We also have definitely watched something recently. So I think you got to watch it first. We're talking about DC Universe and yeah. Titans, which is their first original series that came out. Um, I think I'm going to let you go for it because you had a little more time with it. I kind of crammed it in, but I, we both kind of agreed that it's not physical comics, but you know, it's it's a screen representation of something that we all... I, I mean, well, I have a love for the Titans, so. Well, that's that's one of the things. Everybody has an association with the Titans, whether you love them or, you know, you know, from Young Justice to Go right. to yep. the series before Go, people have an opinion about the Titans. And, <laughs> one um, or two. Yeah. But, like, we got that leaked footage back in the day or Entertainment Weekly or whatever it was of Starfire, and that kind of sunk everyone's battleship. Yep. out the gate of like how bad she looked. And I'll say, and I think you might, I think you might agree with me on screen. Like it didn't look bad. Like no. And, candid- and yeah, Good. I, I kind of got to that point where there's a moment later in the episode when Starfire shows, shows up that I was like, okay, okay. Yep. Nope. Uh, we completely lack the context of how and why she's dressed. We still kind of do. Um, but that's so, okay at this point. Yeah, I didn't hate it because it was clear there's a lot of setup going on in this first episode. And so I'm I'm at a I don't hate it yet. If if that get up doesn't go away, I might start coming back to not liking we, it as much. <laughs> we've been told that uh she's going to actually get Canon costume. Nice. Yeah. At some point. Um so, but in general, the Titan series has been part of DC Universe's deal, and they're releasing one episode weekly. And in fact, I think Hawk and Dove has already dropped um, the second episode. It just really t- gives us something we haven't quite seen on the level of a comic book service doing their own streaming content. You know, and that that's a game changer for the comic book industry at all, period. Yeah. Um. Um, I pay my, I guess, $70 a year for DC Universe. And, um, you know, if with the service you get access to a ton of comic books, um, my daughter has read hundreds of comic books just in like the month we've had it. Yeah, the backlog looks really good for their catalog right now. Um, and I even watched uh, Justice League Gods and Monsters, which I hadn't invested in before. And that was pretty fantastic. Um, but that was probably one of the best DC animated movies I've watched in a while. Um, but anyway, like with Titans, you know, it gives us this dark story of Robin who has been away from the character of Robin for a year or the persona. He's a detective in Detroit. Okay. And, yeah. um, and then you've got Raven who is on the other side of the country, I guess. And she's basically like an episode of like the grudge or the ring or something. <laughs> Right. Um, and honestly, some of her stuff was better than some of those movies that I've watched. Um, and then you've got Starfire who wakes up with no memory being shot at by like Russian mobsters. Um, so not your, not your I, typical Titan story so far. <laughs> not it's it's not your typical Titan story. And the fact that like uh, Dick Grayson is like 
20 years older than, um, right. No, that's a good point. Raven. Like this isn't, this isn't like high school Dick Grayson or college Dick Grayson. This is, he's a detective. So like early thirties, maybe late twenties. That's but, what um, it looks like. That's kind of the feel. And Raven's like a 14 year old. Yep. So, um, and she's got a great demonic inner monologue where her dark self communicates with her. And um, it's pretty visually impressive. And I will say this, you get one solid in the first episode, you get one solid Robin fight scene. Yes. That is gritty as crap. I'm just um, like, it's cringeworthy, like um, on the violence level, like borderline Netflix Punisher. Yeah, um, so so be warned. Um, if, if you have Teen Titans Go or just Teen Titans in your head, um, it, take a moment and watch this before the kiddos. <laughs> um, because yeah, I I I thought that fight scene was awesome, but I was also like, okay, yeah, we're stepping it up a little notch. Uh, DC went dark and brooding. Cool. Um, where's Zack Snyder on this scale? Let's go a thousand percent in the other direction. Well, and that's that's one <laughs> thing too. It's Zack Snyder level. Oh, dark, yeah. yep. but with like much better action. There's Ooh. Only, there was I, that. That's oh, fair. That's I, fair. I'm I'm gonna hate myself for saying this. Um, it's okay. It it's not being recorded on, or anything. <laughs> <laughs> it feels bad on my tongue before it even comes out. Ooh. But like, um, the fight scene with Robin was probably better than most of the choreographed fight in Batman versus Superman. Okay, um, no, that's totally fair. I'm actually um, very okay with that. This this one Robin fight scene is better than most of Zack Snyder's action. Oof. That makes me sad inside. Like no, it's a straight up, it's better than all of the fight scenes in Justice League. And I'm no, just gonna Nobody's uh, mother's name Martha. So it's all good. At least far as we know. As far as we know. Um, but I'm excited the second episode of it with Hawk and Dove. And by the way, if you manage to make Hawk and Dove look cool, you're winning. Um yeah. And Hawk and Dove look dope. Um, Hawk and Dove look like they came out of the Watchmen universe at this point. Um, like, that was my first thought. I was like, when I was watching the Hawk and Dove trailer, I'm like, the comedian could walk by and it would be pretty noteworthy. I'd be so, totally okay with that. So DC Universe, if you could get on that, that is the crossover that we deserve. Uh, Jeff, I, I, I hope you're listening, Jeff Johns. Um, yes. You're doing the Doomsday Clock if, thing. If not, so if the not doors Jim open. Is- Right. <laughs> please, please call us, Jeff. We'd love to have you on the podcast. Um, no, but bottom line, I at first I was totally skeptical um, because of how dark and, you know, the expletive Batman thing. But now in context, I kind of get it um, that that's that Dick Grayson's a little darker than I want him to be, but I don't hate it because they tried to balance him really quickly with the whole um, interaction with Raven that I was like, okay, I, I, I feel what's happening here. Um, well, that's it's one of the things I enjoy super too. visually dark, um, but it, I, I, his, I want to see episode darkness, two now. So I went it's from not something he wants. I'm kind of questioning this to, okay, okay, DC, you have my attention. I want to see how this plays out. So that says something. Yeah, it's like the fact that his his darkness isn't something he actually wants. So moving right along with the podcast, we'll get to the main body of what Hector and I wanted to talk about this week, and that's Heroes in Crisis and Daredevil. So Hector, how about you set us up uh, for Heroes in Crisis? Unless I'm wrong, uh, the concept of where Heroes in Crisis takes place was kind of introduced in a Red Hood annual. Um, It was the first time I heard of it. Um, But... uh, Roy Harper rescues Jason Todd from uh, Batman beating the daylights out of him. And by the end of the story, though, Roy is uh, once again dealing with his demons and his sponsor, which is Killer Croc, which I love, uh, recommends that Roy go to Superhero Rehab, um, which is a place called Sanctuary. And uh, that's the first I had heard of it. But Heroes in Crisis kicks off with a a superhero rehab called sanctuary where someone has gone in and murdered a lot of heroes um yeah tom didn't uh take any milliseconds to warm up to the story did he no it's like you open the book and you're looking at a body count and the sad part is 
the body count includes a lot of bodies, you know, yep. um, and, uh, but the story focuses around Harley Quinn and booster gold, yep. which freaking slow clap for you. Um, <laughs> because, uh, ever since 52, I've had a much bigger appreciation for booster gold. And if you're going to start off a crossover multi-level giant comic book event with booster gold, getting manhandled by Harley Quinn. Um, I say you're doing your job right. And uh, I enjoyed it, but it's, it's this gut punch of an entire, you know what it feels like to me? It feels like identity crisis, but stronger identity crisis started off. um, Brad Meltzer's phenomenal seven issue story. Um, Identity crisis started off with uh, the, murder of Ralph Dibney's wife, Sue Dibney. And the, the idea that uh, sensitive subject matter, but that right. S- Sue Dibney at one point had been raped by Dr. Light mm. and that the justice league had gotten into the business of not only erasing memories, but altering minds. Um, And it was this, it was, I'd say identity crisis was probably one of the darkest, but most poignant stories of DC's catalog, you know, a decade ago. Sure. And I have a feeling just coming off of issue one of heroes in crisis, that this is going to be what we look back on in 10 years and say that was their next step. Um, yeah, so for those that don't really know, DC has had a lot of different crises. Um, so crisis is kind of a thing in and of itself for the DC universe and where usually very serious universe altering type events occur. Um, so, I mean, I know that that's kind of broad, but at the same time, that is kind of what um, crisis has done for the DC universe in the past. So usually once we get to something that has crisis in the title, we know that it's probably going to hit pretty hard. And then couple that with Tom King, uh, who is just the master of kind of putting us in the head of his characters. And that's definitely kind of the feel of where this one's going to be because sanctuary itself, what we kind of find out is this place where the justice league and superheroes can go to decompress just their lives that they see so much trauma, so much craziness. They've seen the deaths of their friends. They've seen the deaths of innocence Um, that superheroes. Most of them are people too. Um, Some of them aren't obviously, but they have feelings and they're going through these really crazy stories that Tom King said up front that this is going to be a PTSD story. Um, So we're going to talk about what it, means for these heroes to go through these events but sanctuary was literally supposed to be that safe place that they could go to decompress and knowing that off the front like you said we literally see bodies of heroes prominent ones and we're probably going to eventually slip up having this conversation so if you don't want it to be spoiled uh, you hit pause now uh, and you run out to your local comic shop real quick read heroes in crisis and then you can come back um but they're not insignificant. Um, and Tom and DC has claimed to us that the deaths are supposed to stick. Now we'll see because it's comics. We've heard that a billion times. I mean, <laughs> we're on Wolverine for what? Um, and that type of thing. So, but at the same time, it still hits pretty significant that you're like, wow, we're one issue out of nine in and two significant people are already bloodied and dead on the floor. And yeah, I, I was just like, wow, we're, we're not slowing down. And it was, I think the thing that also just really hit me off the top, other than leading with booster gold and, and Harley, like you said, is the introduction to the pieces is Batman and Superman rushing there. And they're talking in their very typical Bruce and Clark uh, this is confirmed. This is confirmed. It's like, yo, your your friends are dead. And he's like, yeah, confirmed. I was just like, whoa, okay. Yeah, watching Superman's reaction and uh, to it was a little chilling. Um, 
I gotta say that, but it wasn't in Heroes in Crisis, but it was in the tie in a tie in issue, mm-hmm. the current Red Hood issue. Um, if you've if you've been keeping up with Red Hood at all, um, Jason has been kicked out of the Bat family um, yep. for excessive violence and whatnot, and uh, the entire issue of the current one is Bruce coming to tell R- Jason that his friend is dead. Right. Um, and you know, the last time they saw each other, they literally almost beat each other to death. And he comes in plain clothes as Bruce Wayne, no costume to just hug Jason and tell him that Roy died. Um, and I, did I say that? Oh no. (laughs) Yep. Um, okay. so, but, but well, at the same time we said that was going to happen and yeah, it's it true. So, so Roy Harper, um, Red Arrow. Uh, Red Arrow, who's been through some stuff. Um, and he's been, been DC's whipping boy for decades. Right. So, I mean, I actually was like, <laughs> wow, I, I had some difficulty with that because yeah. So you get just where you were at that Jason's like, that's, that's one of my good friends and decompressing that. Um, I don't know if you read the Green Arrow that came out that was also the direct tie. No, um, I haven't. Oh, so go. So you talked to me in the reading the Red Hood piece for this discussion. Uh, you need to go read the Green Arrow one because the Green Arrow one is his funeral and Ollie decompressing over what that means and what he was. Oh, shut Roy. your mouth. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, no. Um, DC is not messing around. <laughs> that, yeah. So the. Uh, Ollie is definitely taking very personally his protege that he had seen through so much. And there's a splash page in that issue that shows all of it. Um, oh, from wow. the iconic drug cover is mixed in there and some of the other My stuff. My word is a junkie. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, so that was it, such a douchey cover, by the way. I bet. <laughs> it was uh, beautiful. It was it was a great way to tell the story, but like man, way way to just like take the cultural issue to sell stuff and then like make your kid like look like you're publicly shaming him. But whatever. Well, yeah, but it it's but you know the the reason it was so iconic was they fought the comics code on that one that you're not supposed to talk about these things. So DC went that way with that one and then Spider Man went the other direction um at Marvel, but you know, basically they were like, okay, this thing of morality and the comics code exists, but stuff happens in real life. So let's get back to talking about life. So yeah. I, I agree with you, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of interesting in comic book history, if you will, that, Oh, it, it's, it's, in that the was, canon. A, I mean, that was a turning deal. point um, for comics and the type of stuff we talk about, which leads us to today with bleeding out dead superheroes on the floor of basically their psychiatrist. And that's just wild. Yeah, I'm I'm really pumped to see where it goes. Um, and I'll just say this: um, the artwork was flipping phenomenal. Oh, um, this is a visually stunning book, no doubt. It, and Tom King even tweeted about that. That uh, he's like, I'm not going to speak to the writing, but he said that not only was the art in Heroes in Crisis the the best of what's going on right now, that they stepped the game up of the whole industry. Um, I posted, you know, I usually once a week post on the Faith and Fandom page, like my favorite panels of the week. And um, I posted one of Harley and someone commented on the page. I hate Harley Quinn as a character. I would never intentionally read something she's in, (laughs) but this is gorgeous and I want to pick it up. Um, So Uh, I think that vividness is going to be a lot to this story. Um, That we're going to get hit by the writing, but we're also going to get hit by the images and I think that was the thing for me as well as we get introduced to Harley and Booster um, sitting in this diner in the middle of nowhere. Both of them tattered. Very Norman of, Rockwell. Right. Um, so, you know, he's like having his pie and, and stuff and Harley and Booster kind of kick it off. And so back to like the point, we, we don't know who killed the people at sanctuary and tore the place apart. We don't have context. We have a hint at the very end of the first issue that it might be actually a hero, but we don't know. And that is the setup between Harley and booster is you assume Harley's presence means she probably had something to do with it. Uh, She's a villain quote unquote, but she actually immediately 
accuses Booster and Booster's like, you'd be crazy. And they get into their fight. Um, and to your point, Booster Gold is front and center of a major DC story in 2018. And to me, that's freaking awesome because... <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> right. You know, it's like you said, I'm the greatest DC superhero that you've never heard of is like his tagline. Um, and just being able to put that because he's very egotistical. So it's awesome that they're going to use that part of Booster in the fact that he's he can also time travel. So not only has he seen crazy stuff, he's seen it in multiple timelines and universes. And so, that this is something that he's yeah. not ready for. It says a lot. Yeah, and um, I don't know about you, but Booster also not having skeets around tells me that there's something there. Well, I didn't see skeets. If I'm not mistaken, and I've I've got to revisit this, I don't know if skeets made it out of um that Batman issue. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure either, and that kind of depends on the continuity. But um, they're both Tom King. So, yes, I don't know. but Skeets also was shown in the end of 50 with the group. Um, but we okay. don't we don't have a lot of context outside of that, except that that may explain why Skeets and him are not together. So actually, that's a really good point, um, because Tom is really good at interrelating his stories that I might have just answered my own question by thinking logically about it. Go figure. Yeah, oh, you're right. At that at that big group shot at the end of right. 50s. Yep. there. Mm-hmm. Oh. If anything, actually, that could be a really interesting way for him to transition Booster into the dark place. Well, yeah, no, but, in, you know, for, for what we're talking about, the end of issue 50 of Batman, the wedding that didn't happen, there is <laughs> a uh, collage shot of every... DC villain slash character that had interacted in the first 50 issues of Batman that they're all working together. Yep. And there was a shot of Bane, uh, who is the ringleader of all this drama and all these other villains, but Skeets was alongside them. Yep. Um, which goes, tells me a little bit that maybe Skeets was also responsible for the whole thing of the, with that little two issue arc of booster gold or two or three issue arc that that might've also been part of Bane's deal. So the, the bottom line here is it's an opening salvo and what most likely is going to be a very interesting, it's a nine issue mini. There are tie-ins um, so far. It's not as bad as some comic book um, it's not event. The, it's not spider clones, right? It's not every book on the shelf tied in, but I might be speaking too early because comics do that. But so far they are at least showing that the events of this are actually impacting the stories of the other individuals. So like we said, Red Hood, Nightwing and Green Arrow so far have had explicitly connected stories. But I think the thing that is why we're probably going to talk, end up talking about this again is we're looking at the psychology of superheroes and what happens when they potentially hit a breaking point of just seeing and doing too much. And I'm really excited to see how this plays out. Um, if we get more history about um, Sanctuary, I think it's also really cool. This is like my quick hit. Um, why Harley is, well, if we're going to get into her background, she was a psychiatrist at Arkham that that's where she came from, that I'm kind of curious if Tom's going to pull that part of her character out in this storyline somehow, because otherwise, why why is she there? She was, and if you followed her books, she's been a practicing psychiatrist at points. Mm -hmm. Like, so even in Rebirth, like, I think at the beginning of her stages in Rebirth, she was practicing. Um, (sighs) But no, it's... Yeah, he's just really great at pulling those little pieces together. But it's, it's the whole concept of like what we saw even with Alan Moore's Joker of everybody is one bad day away. Um, right. And these heroes have had a lot of bad days. And you can only go through so much of this stuff before it affects your soul, before it affects who you are as a person, before it affects your ability to cope. Um, right. And that's why I found the last page of issue one to be so impactful that I won't blow that one because we've kind of talked a bit about what you will find on that page. But 
apparently when people come to sanctuary, they, the sessions are recorded is what is implied. Yeah. Um, and you have what appears to be boosters intake video, if you will, or at least part of it. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that kind of unfolds because it was very raw and it was very much booster can travel through time. I'm the most amazing hero that you've never heard of. And I need help. And I think that's such a great, it's a great message in general because as a culture, we still avoid talking about this type of stuff, but it's very real. Um, It's very real for folks in the military, folks that work as doctors and nurses, folks that are EMTs and firefighters. I mean, we can also fall victim to the tragedies that heroes come into our lives. And I, I think Tom is not going to avoid the social commentary of that. These issues are real. They're things we should be aware of. And even the most strong meta human and humans and superheroes are not immune to the reality of the things that we see and do. And that's, and that that's amazing. That's going to be a counterpoint to a lot of what you see in comics yep. is that most of the time mental illness is used as a plot device. Exactly. Um, uh, stress, anxiety, depression, uh, you know, multiple personalities, stuff like that. That's used as a plot device and never as something that actually needs help and to be dealt with. And, you know, not to flip it too hard, but honestly, that's also something you see in church culture and in Christian culture. Oh, absolutely. We, we do the same thing. We're like, my church just did a series on depression and anxiety. And, you know, it was one of those things that, you know, saying, you know, a little prayer and Bible will fix it. You know, that's not good enough. Um, mm-hmm. And people, people are struggle. And so a book that actually is going to deal with that is pretty big. So long story short, we're only in the first issue of heroes in crisis. Go pick this junk up and you should get on. It. If you don't read any other books right now, you should probably commit to this. Yeah. So that's my two cents. Yeah, that this is it's it's a great onboarding point, and it also would get you plugged into a couple other issues like we talked about through the tie-ins, um, which is the point of comics. But uh, this is a great place to do it. So I think the other thing we wanted to hit at least briefly, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about it as it unfolds in the next couple weeks, was on the other side of the aisle of the big two over at Marvel. Um, Daredevil has been amazing. That um, Fisk, the kingpin, became mayor of New York multiple issues ago. There's been a few story arcs about the unfolding nature of that. Um, But we've hit an arc in this story where it's straight up titled, you know, this is Daredevil's going to die or the death of Daredevil that we don't know what is coming, but they've implied that this this is... I always hate that, too. Right? You know, they're basically, especially if they're telegraphing the punch and they don't, like, do something weird, but... Well, it's like um, with that that year long thing back in the late two thousands of uh, the Batman R I P. Oh right, <laughs> and I'm like, how you gonna tell me for like a year and a half you killing Batman and then you sort of kill Batman? Come on, um, it's how you go whatever. fifty issues and about a wedding and not have a wedding. Ooh. Oh no, he didn't. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but yeah, um so I think we're both excited because there's been lots of interesting Matt Murdock is an interesting individual in and of himself. Spoilers if you didn't know that. Matt Murdock, the assistant district attorney in Manhattan is also Daredevil. If you wow, didn't remember that, for everyone. well, if they didn't remember it it's because the purple man erased their memory. And that hasn't entirely been undone yet. You can look that up. That happened. Um, So, but Matt's kind of been going through a rather traumatic experience um, himself. uh, Other than the fact of having like one of his most arch enemies literally become the mayor of his city legitimately. So it appears. Um, Well, to me, dude, that just straight up feels like the whole President Luthor thing. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's not super original, but still, you know. (laughs) Dude's in, yeah. dude, dude's in charge. Um, Matt does a couple things to try to keep his eye on him. Uh, the evil demons show up. Uh, we do plenty of that. Um, we see the clan's presence and everything that's going on. 
So there's powers that are tugging and pulling and Matt's just like, cool, as the usual, New York is just getting torn apart in the middle and I'm supposed to be the protector of Hell's Kitchen and well, oops. Um, but they open this Death of Daredevil with, he just he just got his behind handed to him. And so he's pretty messed up already and he's like, no, this, you know, this is the, this has got to end moment. Uh, so I think... I'm excited for where this is going because honestly, for folks that don't read a lot of Marvel, Daredevil is where I point people and I go, nope, what Charles Sewell is doing over there is freaking amazing. And by the way, he writes a lot of the Star Wars stuff that I really like. So that's the connection oh, really? for you. Yep. Nope. That's okay. why it's that's why it's really good um, because he's amazing. But for Daredevil, what makes him so amazing is he's a lawyer. So that's why. Matt sounds pretty freaking intelligent during a lot of his stuff. Um, so it's really cool what's happening there. The art is actually pretty freaking awesome right now as well. Um, but Matt's kind of been piecing the band back together. Foggy and him had kind of gone their different ways for quite a while, and he's been getting Foggy back into the fray. And so this battle is being set up. And I think that's where we can kind of leave this discussion, unless you had some things. There were a couple cool things in this, um, but the main I thing just, for everyone, I, yeah, go for it. My my main issue is like, I I didn't feel like the previous arc resolved. Yeah, it didn't. Like, uh, <laughs> that's like, what the crap? You set this up for four issues and just walk away? Um, dude, it felt like, uh, hey, we fe- we realize this is lame. We're going to stop. Um, they, the previous run had (laughs) daredevil had his fictional brother accidentally be brought to life. Yeah. That was a little crazy. And then they just walked away and, um, I'm like, wait, I get, you're going to play this in later. And I swear to you, you hear me now it's recorded on tape. If they (laughs) use that as the daredevil that dies in a few issues, they bring in the fictional brother. If Mike Murdoch is the daredevil that dies, screw you guys. Just putting it out there. You suck. And I'm sad at you. <laughs> so. Oh, no. Now I'm sad now that you mention it because you're right. You know, he because he made that connection with Fisk and then he just kind of disappeared. Oh, no. So, yeah, he'll have he'll have his literal redemptive moment of, oh, I've sided with the wrong side. I can make it right. Oh no. Okay. Well, at least you've heard the theory here first folks. Um, (laughs) if, if Hector and I are really sad when we come back for episode two, um, maybe it'll be a little later than that because it'll be later than that. That'll be a few months, but we, we can potentially at least see the pieces. If we're just really sad when it starts, it's probably because Mike Murdoch is dead and it's not because Mike's dead. It's, it's because it was a thing to begin with, but If you're a fan of Daredevil and a lot of Daredevil's expanded universe and the characters that are within it, I think this arc is setting up for good. Because like I said, the band's getting back together. Um, And not to super spoil, but at the same time, it's kind of important to the story of... So Mike, his imaginary made real brother, is a thing. And Elektra's back. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot going on. Uh, well, you've you've been a lot more in Daredevil history recently than me. Um, w- how long has it been since Elektra's been in the picture? Well, the complicated part there is she has been in and out in in Sewell's run, but it's kind of the, that longer story of still picking apart what was their relationship. Um, so when she's come back, it's still kind of been standoffish and basically the I I should kill you. That's what I do um type thing but this time around uh when you read the book you'll find out why it's different i won't spoil that particular part but Electra's back and apparently she's back with at least some type of vested interest in what has taken place or at least that's what it appears to be it's comics anything is possible can i just also say like uh in in the issue you see uh daredevil's rope be cut by a warrior in a mysterious costume. Mm. Um, dude, that's legit straight taken out of Batman Hush 608. Nice. Like, literally, a Batman's rope is cut midair by a knife that's thrown 
and he oh, falls nice. by a mysterious figure. Like that's legit. <laughs> the same, the same thing happens in Batman six hundred eight. That was my hush is one of my is one of my all time favorite stories. So I'm like, this is the same thing. Go on, <laughs> right? Absolutely. So all we're trying to say is, Heroes in Crisis. You should pick that up. Daredevil. If you haven't been reading. Possibly jumping on now would be a little crazy, but at the same time, you can go back a few issues um, to begin where Fisk actually took over um, as mayor and jump in and be just fine. But know that on the DC and on the Marvel side, we didn't talk a lot about some of the other comic uh, publishers this time around, but there's a lot of really great storytelling and we just want to be able to dive into those issues and share what we think is cool, where some of those things overlap with real life. And that's what the pull list is all about. That's what Hector and I try to do on a day-to-day-ish basis or as much as we can because we're total nerds. And that's why we're super happy to be here on the Love Thy Nerd podcasting network. So like we said at the top, uh, we're we're going to be here every two weeks. We're going to talk about comics. If you want to talk about comics with us, you know, remember to like, share, comment on this episode. Tell us what you think. Um, definitely. You'll be able to find us on the network and on the lovethynerd.com website going forward. We're just super excited to be here and talk comics and get real nerdy with y'all. And it's not just going to be us talking to each other every episode. We're hoping to bring in some really cool folks that we know in the industry, some writers, some artists, and talk to them about their creative process, why they do what they do, and how life interacts with what they do on a daily basis. So... I know I'm super excited to be here. Hector um, is super excited man. to be here. Right, well, he said man. So, you know, we'll, we never know. Yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Yeah, we'll see uh, if we, you, you know, take those one star reviews and you can keep them. Um, five stars only. It's really good. Um, I mean, at least I think my mom's going to give me five stars. Hi, mom. Uh, that's how that works. But this is super cool for us to be able to be here and just talk comics. Um because comics is just life, man. It's artists and writers that have taken their cool stories and put them to paper. Sometimes they're extraordinary and sometimes they are exactly what we needed to hear at the right time. So I think that's going to do it for us today. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, once again, I'm Chris Poirier. Hector, who are you again? And I'm Hector Mira. So that's Hector. And... Guys, just read comics. That's the best advice that we can give you each and every time. It sounds really weird, but you know it's that's like the that thing. Like that Boz Lerman song from the late '90s, early 2000s about wear sunscreen. Oh right, yeah. yeah. So uh, wear, it's, wear we're sunscreen. telling you to read comics. Wear sunscreen. Read comics. Play more games if if you do that kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about. And just know this is the place for your comic fix, and we're here. So I'm Chris Poirier. He's Hector. Read more comics. You've been listening to the Pull List Podcast with Chris Poirier and Hector Mirai, part of the Love Thy Nerd Podcast Network. Be sure to rate and review the show and share on all the social media. We're gonna take all seven continents of the game of risk. The master of epic duels.